in talking about vitamin C, mitochondria, and cellular energy, they're really <clears throat> pretty close to being all part of the same system. The whole idea of a healthy lifestyle, eliminating toxins, taking in nutrients, it all boils down to energy metabolism at the cellular level. That's it, okay? If you're producing energy in excess of what you absolutely required, you're healthy. If you're not, you're sick. And if you're severely depleted, you're very sick. So in this little presentation, I'm going to first start out with some of what I consider to be important foundational concepts about the role that vitamin C plays in the body. Uh, as, it, as it turns out, I'll tell you, vitamin C is literally, not figuratively, literally the fuel on which the body runs. Okay, so when people say, well, can I take too much vitamin C? I said, well, I don't know. Can you eat too much nutritious food? Maybe. But for all intents and purposes, there is no toxicity that's ever been established with vitamin C, okay? Uh, we, we take the example of the fact that, and some psychotic patients do this, you can literally ingest rapidly over five or 10 minutes several gallons of water and dilute out your blood electrolytes, develop cerebral edema, go into seizures and die. That's with water. Well, I don't know, I think by any regular definition of toxicity, being able to be killed by something makes water toxic. You can't do it with vitamin C, unless you just have diarrhea to death. Okay. Now, uh, in all my presentations, I try as much as possible to blend as much scientific fact I can into the thesis that I'm trying to propose uh, and, and get through. And in that regard, <clears throat> I've stopped a long time ago from just typing out the whole article and all. So any, anytime you see a number, you can go to PubMed, type that number in, hit search, and you'll go straight to the article in question, sometimes the whole article, but at least the abstract. <clears throat> Now, there's a concept out there called redox chemistry, reduction, oxidation, biochemistry. And there's no question that vitamin C is foundational in this concept. I mean, all antioxidants can participate in redox reactions to one degree or another, but vitamin C is clearly the, the king of this cascade. And what it boils down to, as I said, vitamin C is the fuel. Well, technically, vitamin C provides the fuel, which is electrons. You prosper and are extremely healthy with a high electron flow in exchange. The sicker you get, the less that flow goes. And when you're ready to kick the bucket, that flow stops. Okay, so everything relates to what we call electron dynamics. Electron dynamics produce the life force. It's really, it's really that clear cut. So not only do electrons produce energy, they also disseminate the energy, okay? Um, I don't know if I have a slide on this later on or not, but I think we're all increasingly aware that we do have microcurrents in the body, okay? And, and they help sustain healthy cells. Well, guess what? Remember from your physics, current, microcurrent, is electron flow. That's all it is. So we have vitamin C in great abundance, along with other antioxidants, 
not being impeded or blocked by toxins, and you not only have an electron exchange from one molecule to the next, this promotes an electron flow. And when that flow is high, you have a healthy transmembrane voltage that's been clearly established to be associated with the healthiest cells. Uh, one of the clearest parameters of when a cell is sick is when that transmembrane voltage drops below, I think it's 50. Now, I want to be very specific about definitions, okay? When a biomolecule, and what do I mean by a biomolecule? I mean a, mole a molecule integral to the function of your body. A protein, a nucleic acid, a sugar, an enzyme. Uh, all of these things are what we call biomolecules. Now, when those biomolecules are replete, they have their full contingent of electrons, they're stable and normal and able to function normally, okay? However, when they become oxidized, which is they've lost one or more electrons, many things can happen to a molecule when it's oxidized, but for the sake of simplicity, what always occurs when a biomolecule is oxidized is it becomes dysfunctional or afunctional. So it has either less biological function or it becomes a complete block in the system having no biological function but still getting in the way of other biomolecules that would like to exert their normal function. And now this is, I hope, a, you'll appreciate a foundational concept. I consider it to be a foundational concept. We talk about oxidation causing disease. Well, that's technically true, but the truest way to think about it is oxidized biomolecules are disease. That is it. They are disease, and believe it or not, they will make up the entire spectrum of diseases that you see. So whether it's Alzheimer's, whether it's cancer, uh, whether it's... Uh, migraine headaches, asthma, you name it, it's all oxidation of an array of biomolecules in a certain area, in a certain concentration that determines the expression of that disease clinically <clears throat> and the effectiveness of your therapies, whatever they are, are only effective to the degree that they stop new oxidation and they start to reduce or repair old oxidation. That's it. There's a tremendous complexity to the human body, no doubt about it. But in this regard, there's a tremendous simplicity. And that simplicity is all disease is oxidation and all effective therapy is reduction. That's it. So, and the other important concept is to realize that Toxin and prooxidant are synonyms. They mean the same thing. The only way a toxin can cause its toxic effect is by directly oxidizing or causing to be oxidized biomolecules. And it just depends on where those molecules are, What's the con chemical configuration of the toxin such that it gets to a certain area of the tissue but not another? These are all the parameters that give you the variability. For example, cyanide. Cyanide, if you inhale it, it'll quickly get taken up, I believe, into the mitochondria where you're getting respiratory uh, mechanisms. It selectively, due to its chemical configuration, oxidizes the most critical molecules that are needed to incorporate oxygen. And so with a minute or two, you can't incorporate oxygen anymore and you die, okay? But as dramatic and rapid and quickly and profound as that effect was, it was still nothing more than oxidation. Whereas you can be exposed to mercury for 30 years 
and it's not usually imminently and dramatically toxic by the molecules that it oxidizes, and instead you present with multiple sclerosis 30 years later, okay? So a pro-oxidant takes electrons away. Pro-oxidants are all toxins. Toxins are all pro-oxidants. And the antioxidant gives or restores electrons back. Now, um, in this slide here, I think, has a great deal of simplicity, but really gets to the point of the matter. All disease not only results from what I just said about oxidation, it has to do with the ongoing balance between pro-oxidants, which are toxic molecules, antioxidants, which are nutrient molecules, and pathogens, which are the primary toxic molecule providers. Yeah, if you live next to an aluminum plant, you're going to be aluminum toxic, and it's not going to have anything to do with infections. But day in, day out, well over 95% of the people in this room, your overwhelming source of toxins that compromise and deteriorate your health on a daily basis come from infections in your body. And of those infections in your body, well over 95% come from your mouth, come from your gums, come from infected teeth, which are virtually always asymptomatic, you don't know they're there, and your tonsils. When your tonsils drain these infections nonstop for months, years, and everything else gets corrected, then the tonsil becomes your Trojan horse. It looks normal, but it's still grossly infected and will give you a heart attack just as quickly as a root canal. So I mentioned here, uh, just to be more elegant on this point, when, you, when we're only talking about oxidation, and again, I'm going on about this because it's in many ways the most important part of this presentation to understand the significance of everything else I'm going to say. You ask the question, or you can pose the question, which biomolecules are oxidized? Where are they located? What's the percentage of those biomolecules that are oxidized, and how long have they been oxidized? All of those parameters determine whether you just have a mild symptom or a severe illness. So, as I said, no oxi increase. And I emphasize the point of increased oxidative stress. I mean, everybody's got oxidative stress because the pathology of life, if you will, produces oxidative stress. I mean, you metabolize your oxygen, you produce what's called physiological degrees of oxidative stress. And this is why, even if you are able to exist in a complete toxic-free existence, you'll eventually die because of the cumulative effects of that physiological oxidative stress. It's just that if we have our calculations right, and you're able to avoid all huge toxin exposures, uh, that death should be coming closer to 110 and 115 than it should be coming to 80 or 85 or 75. Now, why is vitamin C then so important and represents what I call the prototypical antioxidant, okay? A lot of antioxidants, some of them on this OREX score come out as being more potent than vitamin C and then they're part of supplements because this is a supplement that's more potent than vitamin C. Well, only in the sense of if it's in the perfect environment, it'll give up its electron quicker than vitamin C. But think of the physical and biochemical qualities of vitamin C, the molecule. It's very small molecular, tremendous access throughout the body. It has a structure very similar to glucose, and we know glucose gets everywhere in the body, and ultimately that's the important thing about how impactful an antioxidant is going to be 
is how well it gets where it needs to go. They, they still seem to, some people still get puzzled to say, well, vitamin C, does it cross the blood-brain barrier? Well, inside neurons, the concentration of vitamin C is 100-fold. That's 10,000% higher than in the plasma. So it, it makes its way across the blood-brain barrier. Also very important, as a single molecule and in a small molecule, it has the capacity to donate two electrons rather than one. So that doubles the potency right there. It also, and I'll just mention this, I don't wanna do too much of a sidebar, but the other thing that makes vitamin C so unique among antioxidants <clears throat> is when it loses one electron, it becomes a uniquely stable product called the ascorbyl radical. So it, it can hang around a while and not just be quickly metabolized, waiting for the opportunity to donate the second electron. And then finally, because of all the above properties, vitamin C is the antioxidant that comes along and regenerates reduced antioxidants that have been oxidized, okay? This is especially important in the case of glutathione, which we're gonna talk about in a few moments. <clears throat> now, sometimes uh, people start wondering, well, what about when vitamin C loses its electrons and when it's oxidized? Isn't it toxic? Isn't that the definition of a toxin? It's got to go get electrons now. Well, yes and no. What a toxin does is, and one of the things that makes a toxin toxic is when it takes electrons away from something, oxidizing it, it becomes biochemically stable. Biochemically very stable. Biochemically stable to the point that it's real happy it's got our electrons and it's not going to give them up again. Vitamin C is like on a teeter-totter, biochemically instability. The stability of the oxidized form and the reduced form are very similar. So it'll go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, but toxins only take and keep. They don't take and give, take and give, they take and keep. All right. <clears throat> Now, as you may have noticed from the title of this presentation, we're going to talk a little bit about mitochondria. And I got to say, as I was researching this, it's, it was tough to get concise information on mitochondria. A lot of people research mitochondria, but they, they never define their terms. They never define what they're talking about. And so uh, I'm going to try to give you the, uh, the quickie course on understanding what a mitochondria is, why it does what it does, and the role that it plays in intracellular dynamics. Just a few little, like they say, factoids. Vitamin C is, uh, mitochondria are found in all cells except for mature red blood cells. And number-wise, depending on how metabolically active and important it is that a certain cell be involved in high energy production, <clears throat> you can have anywhere between 200 and 20,000 mitochondria in a single cell. Now, the next point, I think, really brings home the significance of mitochondria in the body. 20% of the weight in your body is mitochondria. So if you're a little 100-pound lady, you got 20 pounds of mitochondria in you. That's, And it has a fairly quick half-life, 5 to 12 days, which is bad and it's good. The thing good about it is you have pathology going on and you're able to supply good, new, energy-bearing nutrients, vitamin C, etc. If you will, the cell can heal itself pretty well, too. As you probably know, the primary role of mitochondria is to produce ATP and cellular energy. And remember, ATP, when it gets oxidized to ADP, what's it doing? It's giving up an electron. So once again, 
It all comes down to how effectively you get electrons where you need them. <clears throat> Mitochondria are also involved in synthesis of heme, lipids, amino acids, and other biomolecules. And also, very importantly, <clears throat> when, the, um, when the cell starts to get sick, the mitochondria play an extremely important role in initiating and propagating the sequence of events that's involved in programmed cell death, apoptosis. Now, I'm going to show you some diagrams in a moment that'll, if, if all these words don't give you a mental image, but it's interesting, the construction of a mitochondria is that the inner membrane, because there's an outer membrane and an inner membrane, and all of these membranes, this is interesting too, have the same bilipid layer that you have on the outside of the cell. Okay. And when you look at the processes, how the intracellular organelles form and disintegrate, they all have to do with how effectively another double, double lipid bilayer invaginates and then forms an intracellular organelle. So the very innermost part occupies or, or, or contains an area known as the mitochondrial matrix. And when you get, as you proceed out of the mitochondria, where you go from the innermost membrane to the outermost membrane, that's an area called the inner membrane space. Okay. Yeah, I'll jump ahead. The, uh, you can see uh, the diagram of the inner membrane, the outer membrane, uh, the little areas that are like microvilli in the intestine called Christi. And you can see that the electron microscope picture of a mitochondria is very close to the diagram. So, another interesting point about mitochondria, they are the only subcellular organelle. Well, what do I mean by subcellular organelle? Endoplasmic reticulum, lysosomes, uh, a whole host of other lesser ones, but mitochondria are the only ones that have their own DNA, okay? Also because of this, it also makes the mitochondria more susceptible to mutations. And because of that susceptibility, this is what starts to carry, this is why we're starting to develop a whole new set of what's called mitochondrial diseases because they sort, even though they're an integral part of the cell, they're inside the cell, they also have a large degree of autonomy. Now, the liposome. The liposome is something that's artificially made, although there is some question as to whether or not a liposomes also exist in nature. But be that as it may, it's got a lipid bilayer, which is uh, you have a long tail and the heads are hydrophobic, the tails are hydrophilic, and this is why a liposome and a cell typically just enclose water-soluble structures, okay? And the lipids tend to associate with the membrane, the water-soluble structures go inside. So a, a liposome was designed as an artificial cell and was designed to promote <clears throat> studies of how cells worked by having this mechanism. Now you can see on the uh, liposome bilayer there, well, it doesn't work to point to one because somebody's looking at another one. There are also now in nature, and this is where liposomes play a big role, and not just with the liposome encapsulated seed that you've heard about, that's just one of many things that can be done with a liposome. But you have in nature 
what's called extracellular vesicles, and the liposome is one of those. Uh, these are naturally occurring players in inter, not intra, intercellular communication. So they facilitate communication from one cell to another. I mean, did you ever wonder how one part of your body figures out what the other part's doing, even though they're remote from each other? Okay, it's very clear that our body has the capability of remote forms of communication, and I'm not going to say this is the only way, but this is an important way in which that occurs. <clears throat> and these play a role in both physiological and pathological purposes, okay? Uh, they play a great role in stem cell signaling. They play a great role in conveying immune responses. Now, there's basically four types of these extracellular vesicles. <clears throat> there's tiny ones called exosomes, larger ones called microvesicles, and then bigger ones called apoptotic, apoptotic bodies and liposomes. And I'll give you a, a brief rundown of what's the difference there. And exosomes were discovered about 30 years ago, and the sophistication back then was it had a whole bunch of stuff inside it. The body must just trying to get rid of its garbage. Uh, sort of a trashy explanation, if you ask me. Now, these are only 40 to 100 nanometers in diameter. So these are the tiniest ones. <clears throat> in addition to being able to merge with the cell wall and deposit their contents, they're also very capable of passing through the pores in the cell wall and then having a similar interaction with the lipid bilayers of the intracellular organelle. So they could sometimes merge with the outer cell wall and then other times they can pass directly into the cell, no energy needed, and then directly deposit their contents <clears throat> into endoplasmic reticulum, into the mitochondria, into the nucleus. The nucleus also has two layers of this bilipid membrane. Now, these not only can play a role in storage and transport of a wide variety of items, they're actively secreted, actively secreted by many cell types. Um, <clears throat> Sperm, urine, plasma, lavage fluid, also in colostrum. <clears throat> now, in the next size ones are called microvesicles. And they were able to discover that as these were larger, 100 to 1,000 nanometers in diameter, uh, and think about the cell like a weak tire, okay? You massage it, you compress, and then you get a little outward blebbing of the, of the cell wall, and then it pinches off, and there you have a microvesicle. So it's, it, it just will encapsulate whatever you're focusing on in inside the, uh, inside the cell. Apoptotic bodies are very large, and they're large because they're representing the basic encapsulation of the entire cell. So in other words, as the cell is going through programmed cell death, things start to degenerate, oxidize, the physical capacity gets slow, lower and lower, and the pressure gets higher and higher, and then you outbleb a larger area, okay? And you might say, well, what's the point? Well, one of the points is, remember that when a cell dies, it doesn't necessarily rupture. When it does rupture, it's a lot, it's a much greater toxic insult to the body, okay, because they're filled with iron, oxidative debris, and putting a lot of this directly into the blood, like you might, for example, when you <coughs> take a powerful chemotherapy that's uniquely able to kill one type of cancer cell rapidly and you get a massive lysis of these cells and they dump their toxic oxidative contents into the body. Now with regard to liposomes, I mentioned they're very similar to other extracellular vesicles. 
We may have some in nature, but bottom line, the structure of the liposome is such that it's a mid-range extracellular vesicle. So taking any sort of therapy, and they have a lot of liposome therapies out there, not just nutrients like vitamin C, when you, when you use liposomes, you're really imitating biology, okay? And this is one of the reasons why I believe, for example, with vitamin C, you can take five grams of vitamin C, liposome encapsulated, orally, orally, and it will have a much more powerful clinical impact on an acute infection than five grams intravenously. <clears throat> now that might seem counterintuitive at the start, but when you consider the fact that all of the liposome gets absorbed, it goes straight into the lymphatics, gets sucked up selectively by the immune cells, and then makes its way through the um, lymphatic system and the thoracic duct into the bloodstream and then throughout the body, and it delivers those contents without the consumption of energy. When you take vitamin C intravenously, obviously that's, if you will, naked vitamin C. It's not encapsulated by anything. <coughs> In order to get into the cell, if it's reduced, it's got to have an active transport system, the SVCT2 transporter, or if it's oxidized, DHAA, it gets passively taken in by the glute transporters, but it still needs to have energy expended to be brought back into its reduced form inside the cell. So even though you give it intravenously, you consume energy to get it inside the cell. And a point I want to make, and I'm going to emphasize a lot tomorrow when we're talking on some slightly different subjects, is that where the action is, physiologically and pathologically speaking, is inside the cell. That's where the pathology is, and that's where, if you're going to find a cure, the cure is. And so to that end, your goal should always be, not just with vitamin C, but any other nutrient substance that has an antioxidant property, is to optimize its concentration inside the cell. And that's what some of these new advances we're talking about tomorrow are going to concentrate on, is <coughs> how do we optimize intracellular uptake of reduced active vitamin C? That's where it's all about. And that's the case for, I might add, all diseases and all infections. I mean, it's another final common denominator because 100% of chronic degenerative diseases, cancer, heart disease, you name it, have increased intracellular oxidative stress, all of which is associated as well with elevated intracellular calcium levels. So now, uh, you all are probably familiar with this, I'll just highlight it. Uh, whenever you just have energy production in the cytoplasm, which is um, glucose dependent, uh, you produce two molecules of ATP per molecule. But when you use the mitochondria and the electron transport chain and the Krebs cycle, one glucose molecule will produce 36 molecules of ATP. So that's all part of the cancer state when you shift from aerobic to, anaero to anaerobic uh, glycolysis and when you produce <coughs> lactic acid uh, rather than something uh, far less uh, innocuous, like uh, far more innocuous like water. Okay, now. A few more points about this physiology, and then we'll get on to some good stuff. The, the energy generated by the relay, the electron transport chain, the relay of electrons along the electron transport chain 
is used to pump protons out of the innermost part of the mitochondria to the next area out, and this is, results in the electrons being finally accepted by molecular oxygen. Now, because of the fact that you're, if you will, the mitochondria are the action spot for electrons, they're also the action spot for oxidation. And this is why oxidative damage, increased oxidative stress inside the cytoplasm hits the mitochondria so hard and gives us so many of these new diseases we're hearing about mitochondria, <coughs> which really aren't new diseases, they're just a different variation of vitamin C deficiency, okay? The oxidative status of the mitochondria is directly related to the oxidative status of the cytoplasm inside the cell, okay? So you can't really, you can't really have healthy mitochondria in any context if you have unhealthy cytoplasm or a cytoplasm with increased oxidative stress. So, even though there are supplements, and I'm going to talk about them, that will selectively support mitochondrial in function, you still always have to be thinking in terms of, I need to support lessening oxidative stress in the cytoplasm, because this will immediately transfer into lessened oxidative stress in the mitochondria as well. There's glutathione in mitochondria, but it all comes from the cytoplasm. It doesn't make its own in the mitochondria. You, you do synthesize glutathione inside the cell. And glutathione deficiency, we know, leads to widespread mitochondrial damage. And vitamin C, once again, spares and helps to regenerate the glutathione. So once again, that's why, in many ways it's simplistic, but it's true. That's it's great when you have something simplistic and true. And that simplistic point is that if you can get high amounts of reduced vitamin C inside the cell, you're winning and your patient's winning. But it can be difficult. That's the sticker. So conceptually then I call the cell and the cytoplasm and its subcellular organelles basic support structures for keeping the mitochondria healthy. Like I said, you can't have healthy mitochondria and unhealthy cytoplasm. Now what do we do? Oh, another point let me make. Okay, I made this point on this slide. Genetic defect diseases, these are separate situations when you have, all it means really is depending on the enzyme that's involved in a certain genetic deficiency is going to determine uh, whether or not uh, mere support with uh, antioxidants is going to negate that. Sometimes the defect is too overwhelming, sometimes the defect is minimal. Now, I mentioned this just a moment ago when you put vitamin C in the blood that you have SVCT2 transporters. It's a sodium vitamin C dependent transporter. You know how we like to abbreviate everything. And the SVCT2 and the GLUT transporters are also present not just for the cell, but they're present for the, for the mitochondria too. So you have the same uptake mechanisms bringing vitamin C into the mitochondria that you have bringing my, vitamin C into the cell itself. Okay. And logically, and this has been demonstrated, vitamin C administration has been documented to increase mitochondrial vitamin C concentration. So that's again what I was saying where it's all connected and we have the evidence that it's all connected and it, and it allows us to not always have a sophisticated understanding of what's going on but a reasonably good solid concept as to how to make it better. Okay. So, how do you optimize then the redox state of the cytoplasm, okay? 
one of the biggies is calcium, okay? The more calcium you get inside your cell, the unhealthier you get fast, okay? This is why calcium <clears throat> channel blockers work as well as they do, and why calcium channel blockers decrease all-cause mortality. Think about that. You have probably the only prescription drug there is, uh, calcium channel blockers, long-acting, because of the fact that they lessen calcium levels inside the cell, they make every cell in your body healthier. If they didn't make every cell in your body healthier, how could they reduce the chance of death from all diseases? Not just heart disease, not just cancer, not just this. If you have something that decreases your chance of dying from any, anything and everything, it means it's having a specific profound effect on all of the cells of the body and generally on something that all of the cells in the body share as pathology, which in this case is increased calcium. Uh, <clears throat> after doing all the research for my book, Death by Calcium, I, I can tell you with great conviction there does not exist a pathology where there's not increased intracellular oxidative stress and that that oxidative stress is always earmarked, caused by, and associated with an increased intracellular calcium level, okay? You may not have enough calcium in your bones, in your osteoporotic bones. That does not mean you have a body-wide calcium deficiency. Virtually nobody except for people with parathyroid problems have a true calcium deficiency, okay? I think the evidence is absolutely clear-cut that taking any form of calcium on a regular basis is just going to lower your all-cause mortality for the reasons I talked about, increase your chances of cancer and heart disease, <clears throat> and uh, promote calcium deposition throughout your body. I mean, why do we get calcium deposits? We got calcium deposits because we got too damn much calcium in our body. Okay, it's not, in that sense, it's not rocket science. Also, calcium inside the cell, as I said, is a primary regulator of oxidative stress. <clears throat> and the only way, we, we heard about earlier about magnesium. Magnesium is a very interesting and probably, and this is from senior vitamin C here, Magnesium is probably your most important supplement, okay? Why? Well, number one, you absolutely need magnesium for hundreds if not thousands of different enzymatic reactions, uh, but it serves as a physiological calcium regulator, all right? You can't have high both. If you have a high calcium, your magnesium's low. If your magnesium gets, gets up and you're able to get it up, you push the calcium down. Okay, so that's, that's the secret to its longevity. And nothing can do magnesium's job for it. But, I mean, obviously I think everybody should, here should take tons of vitamin C. But for the sake of argument, if you were only gonna take one supplement, it'd be magnesium because other antioxidants can partially compensate for vitamin C. Nothing's gonna compensate for the important things that are going on with magnesium. Now, and they've even studied specific toxins. They're all pro-oxidant, and when they're in some animal studies and cell studies, when they actually look, they can see that as the, as the cell gets more toxic, as the toxin exerts its effect, in this case methylmercury, it again elevates intracellular calcium. So, even though calcium is a key element, I mean, it's an essential nutrient. You die without calcium, but you only need a very limited amount. And above that limited amount, it turns from a nutrient into a toxin. Cell death secondary to toxicity is always associated with the highest of intracellular calcium levels. And when they get really high really quick, that's when you get frank necrosis or rupture, rupture of the cell. When they elevate more gradually, 
That's when you initiate program cell death or apoptosis. Okay. Um, Now let's talk about some mitochondrial support agents. And there's actually a bunch of them. You know, when you're seeing different supplements that are uh, promoted as support agents for good, healthy mitochondria, oftentimes it's a combination of some of these. Vitamin C, of course, number one. Number two, vitamin B1, thiamine, helps get more acetyl coenzyme A, which is essential to initiate the Krebs cycle, generating energy inside the mitochondria. <clears throat> Pantothenic acid. This one is big. This one is big and is very, very underemphasized. Okay? Without pantothenic acid, you can't synthesize coenzyme A and the other two components of which is ATP and cysteine. And it's absolutely essential for the Krebs cycle in generating energy. And the interesting thing about that is that it appears to have a little bit of an analogy to vitamin C in that it's something that we're grossly underdosed on. Okay, I mean, you can't take super mega large amounts of every vitamin. Some of them you really need to stay in the supplementation range. But <clears throat> vitamin C, vitamin K, uh, pantothenic acid, these, pretty much the higher you push them, the better your energy production gets. Now, very important, regular pantothenic acid comes as calcium pantothenate, so you don't want to take mega dosing of calcium pantothenate or you're getting too much calcium. <clears throat> they have another form of pantothenic acid which is called, as you see up there, pantothene. And pantothene is two pantothenic molecules hooked together without any other calcium associated. So that would be the form to supplement on. <clears throat> Vitamin B2, very important in mitochondrial energy metabolism dysfunction. Coenzyme Q10. It's an actual component of the electron transport chain along the mitochondrial cristae. Then a, a weird one I never heard of until I did this research called edebenone, which is a synthetic derivative of CoQ10 and a very powerful antioxidant that's also been used in specifically dealing with some of the inherited mitochondrial diseases in lessening the oxidative stress in the mitochondria. <clears throat> L-carnitine, uh, creatine, D-ribose. Another one that's getting a lot of play these days is NADH, okay, which, you know, for lack of a better word, really powers the process and pushes, pushes uh, the electron transfer chain to completion. Uh, as Dr. Saul talked about, the tocopherols, vitamin E, very important. They have a uh, prescription medicine, dichloroacetate, that's exceptionally, exceptionally potent. Uh, so there, we, don't, don't get into the, the habit of just thinking all mainstream medicine is garbage, okay? A lot of it is, no doubt about it. But a little bit of it isn't, okay? So always sift the facts and make an objective evaluation. Look at the science that's involved, whether it's a nutrient or whether a prescription medication. Alpha lipoic acid, extremely important. <clears throat> and acetylcysteine, which is the rate limiting amino acid in the synthesis, synthesis of glutathione. Omega 3 fatty acids, resveratrol, and then there's our buddy again, magnesium. And then, uh, an odd little thing, this antioxidant that's very good called PQQ. Now supplements to avoid. Uh, iron, copper, and calcium, what do I call the toxic nutrients? Are they essential for life? Absolutely. Are they essential for death? Absolutely. Okay. 
Uh, these are, for example, in the case of iron. Oh, God, on the case of iron. I mean, doggone United States in 1945 opened the floodgates to throwing iron into every fortified food there is, and the rest of the damn world followed suit. Okay, and everybody on this planet is iron toxic because our public health authorities thought it was horrible that children starving in third world countries had iron deficiency anemia, okay? <clears throat> you're never gonna get iron deficiency anemia on the diets that you're on. But if you do, that's the one and only circumstance in which you supplement iron, and you only supplement it in until your anemia is resolved. Don't do it prophylactically. All you're gonna do is uh, and if, uh, let me give you a little something. If you haven't seen it last time, I think I talked about it. Go to YouTube, type in Dr. Levy Iron Video. Dr. Levy Iron Video. And you'll certainly never eat a bowl of cereal again unless it's organic. Copper, <clears throat> copper is like a junior iron. It's another primary upregulator of oxidative stress. And then calcium, we've talked about that. Basic supplementation then. Basic supplementation is, first I like to call the big four, all right? And the big four are the big four because of actually what they do to calcium metabolism inside your body. Uh, magnesium is a natural calcium channel blocker. You pretty much take as much of that as, as you can adjust your bowels to tolerating with. Vitamin D3 to a rough level of 50 to 80 nanogram per cc. Vitamin C, we know, and vitamin K. Now think about this. Each one of these supplements by themselves decrease all-cause mortality. Each one of them is going to decrease your chance of dying from anything, which once again means that each one of these four things is positively impacting oxidative stress-wise every cell in your body. Uh, lysine and proline, these are very good for helping to reverse whatever atherosclerosis sclerosis you have going. Uh, Omega-3 fatty acids mixed to cofferols. Uh, Dr. Saul has talked about that. B-complex. Uh, a lot of the Bs you might want to take larger amounts, but don't, don't get out of the habit of taking at least some of all of them. Very important for nearly everybody to supplement iodine, okay, and potassium iodide. Now, <clears throat> You know, everybody, lots of people write me emails and they say, well, how much do I take of this? How much? For most things, and certainly for vitamin C, there is, isn't remotely, isn't remotely a one size fits all. Why? Because everybody's toxicity is different. So the more toxins you have, if you can't get rid of the toxins or block them from coming in, the more vitamin C you need, okay? so. You, you basically take what you can afford. You can take what makes you feel better. You can take what makes abnormal blood work less abnormal or normalize. Those are your basic parameters. And a biggie, super, super, super biggie, CRP, C-reactive protein, okay? They have the reference range of CRP as being zero to three. No way. If you've got a CRP above one, you need to start working on things. I mean, your, P, your CRP, which is a direct measure of the general body-wise increased inflammatory oxidative stress you have in your body, directly related to increased all-cause mortality. The higher it is, the sooner you're going to die from any particular disease. It's one of your cheapest, best ways to, uh, to keep track as to whether or not what you're doing is getting the job done. Now, just uh, two more slides here and we'll have it wrapped. Now, remember what I said earlier about 
increased intracellular vitamin C. Perhaps a synonym for that is what I call a score-based saturation. That's always your goal with vitamin C, if possible. And remember, when, you're, when just taking regular vitamin C, it'll still get where it needs to go, but the liposome encapsulated vitamin C can get there even quicker and can give a unique degree of access to the intracellular organelles like the mitochondria directly. Finally, the multi-C protocol, okay? Uh, I think you realize by now I'm just not a C does everything, don't do anything else. I mean, it's, it's important to have a, a broad spectrum of things that you're doing that are positively supporting your immune system and decreasing your body-wide oxidative stress. Well, <clears throat> so the multi-C protocol if you're not getting the result that you want with just one form of vitamin C, don't conclude all is lost and you can't still achieve the effect that you want, you take multiple forms. Certainly, you should always take the top two. Take the oral liposome encapsulated, I think I've discussed with the unique delivery properties of getting it inside your cells without the consumption of energy, and clinically being more powerful much of the time than IV vitamin C in equivalent doses. So just taking a gram or two or three a day of that is like taking 15, 16 grams of regular C. But number two is the sodium ascorbate. You work on a sodium ascorbate dose until you find out roughly what your bowel tolerance is and you take close to that every day. Some people it'll be five grams, some people will be 15 grams, some people will be 50 grams, okay? But it neutralizes toxins directly forming in your gut, and believe me, one of the biggest things that bring your health down is, uh, uh, is maldigested food producing the same type of toxins that you see in a pathological mouth. So you get that C in high concentration in your gut, and what does get absorbed goes straight directly into the rich supply of immune cells surrounding the gut. Ascorbyl palmitate is good, it's fat soluble. Intermittent IV, always very good. I'm definitely not talking against IV when I tell you that an equivalent dose of liposome encapsulated is probably better because each does different things. And then finally, intramuscular, okay? Intramuscular, intravenous, goes like that, in and out. Intramuscular, even though it might just be a couple grams, goes like that and gives you a nice sustained release. So Dr. Klenner cured a lot of babies with intramuscular at a dose not nearly close to the type of dose that he used intravenously. So use all your weapons. And there's my email and website. Thank you very much.